Welcome back everybody here on Siegel Talks at the Martini Siegel Theater Center at the Credit Center CUNY in New York City in Manhattan at the City University. And it's another day in, uh, in New York, another day on planet Earth. And um, we still are, and somehow it feels like we're getting even deeper and deeper into the underwood, into the, the, the swamp of, uh, of the COVID crisis after it looked like for a while there might have been some light. Again, uh, over 60,000 infections yesterday. Um, I think five days out of the last eight were records that have never been, uh, numbers have never been so high even since it started in March and especially in April. Um, the idea was to have it under 20,000, but it didn't work out. It looks like most probably will be going up to 100,000. Uh, CDC says that and um, the World Health Organization that Trump foolishly uh, left in the time of the greatest health crisis perhaps in the history of the United States, the big one, he thought it was right to leave the World Health, World health Organization. They yesterday said that the virus is airborne. And if you spend many, many hours in a small room without ventilation, it is no longer just coughing and drops and, uh, and uh, heavier particles with protein. It is in the air. And of course, this is a, a terrible, terrible news. Um, uh, it looks like many, many more people already had it because of that. Uh, it's now a fact. Uh, uh, City MD did tests in all of New York City and it turned out that in that neighborhood that actually is called Corona in Queens, uh, actually 68% of everybody they tested there had the virus, had antibodies, an incredibly high number. Normally it's five, six percent. Um, and one doesn't really know how that happened. Uh, perhaps this immigrant community will be hit less in the next, the second and third waves. And the other neighborhoods now will, will come um, after this. Um, it is clear now that uh, Latino and African-American uh, uh, minority groups uh, are hit three times harder. They are likely to die twice as, as much as, as, as white people. So there is the incredibility of uh, access to healthcare, uh, work situations, and, uh, and, uh, and living conditions um, that uh, puts uh, these groups uh, at a risk. And they are the ones who are working in the health care system, who are bringing things, deliver things, help us. And I think it is uh, exposing, as Richard Shatner said, this uh, crisis, uh, everything that's wrong. We see the structures. It's a Fukushima-like great catastrophes. We are inside. A disaster movie actually we are living it and we see the roof is open what is happening and everything that's wrong and everything that's bad is worse and uh, and it's time that we all have to think what can we do different what can be done differently and we talked for now 14 weeks with artists all around the world to think about what does art what role does it play but ever should play a role isn't it now uh, we at home, of course, are close to art. We read, we listen to music, we watch films, we watch recordings of plays. And it's uh, without question something that sustains us and our soul and keeps our motors warm. But um, still, what is happening to artists who are completely out of work, especially in New York City, where there's no very little help. Until the end of the year, there's nothing for musicians, artists. The Metropolitan Opera hasn't paid its staff since March, the artists, if we understand right. So it's a, it's a shocking time um, we live in. And, um, and in these days, we go back to listen to artists who have been on the right side of justice, on the right side of history, of social progress, on the right side of the complex struggle for freedom. And it's good to remember that there were times uh, in, in this century and the last century where um, struggles uh, were prominent and where it's uncertain what would happen. There was social unrest on the streets. One of those times, of course, was also in the 60s, the time that was so significant that was kind of the birth of what we think about New York art and of the center of the contribution it made to the world and in the middle of this uh, was uh, our guest today, the great John Glot uh, Fanny Tallinn, who um, wrote a play at this time next to uh, many, many others. Uh, it is the explosive uh, 1960s uh, anti-Vietnam play, America, Hurrah. It was a significant work. Um, if I remember right, even Bob Wilson was involved with some uh, sceneries very, very early on. Um, then he did The Serpent with the 
great open theater, the significant open theater, the Tibetan book of the dead, or how not to do it again. I think we have this, we did a reading also at the Siegel Center when he came and we did a retrospective uh, on his work and on his life and many, many other things. He did significant Chekhov translations and, um, and many others, uh, Tea with Demons, a game of transformation. But most significantly, he's also a, in a way an artist that defined uh, the role of the artist in a different way. And said the way you live is so strongly connected to the make, art you make. And uh, he created uh, Shantigar and the Shantigar Foundation for creativity, meditation, and engagement with nature. And it's located in Western Massachusetts on the mountainside where he's now living for 50 years, which is a very long time. And uh, maybe he found early on answers that uh, for questions we are all having now, if I understand why he fled uh, Belgium, uh, World War II, from a family that were persecuted uh, uh, in because of fascist Europe. So um, Jean-Claude, um, welcome um, to Siegel Talks. I apologize for, for having talked uh, a bit. It's all about listening here. So um, Jean-Claude, uh, where are you now, I guess, in Chantica? And yeah. uh, who are you? I am at Chantica. I'm very lucky to be in a beautiful, beautiful place at the moment. You talked about the 60s, and you also talked or you touched on World War II. And I think there was a great connection. I think that I, I, I fled with my family. I was four years old. Some of us got out, some of us didn't. But I think that the terror that was engendered in that time is still in me. I feel that it gave a perspective, it gave it an ability to sound a warning bell with America Hurrah in the 60s. I think all of us that came to the 60s, to the theater of the 60s, were um, trying to reveal the lies that we had been told. We were trying to pull down the facade, to find a vocabulary, a theater vocabulary that would express our feelings rather than simply um, be psychological realism, which is what it was on Broadway at that time. Um, so I think theater at that time in the 60s was a warning bell. It was also then that I began coming up here to, the, to Western Massachusetts, to uh, Shantigar. Shantigar means peaceful home. Uh, the, 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 the farm here, it's a mountainside farm, incredibly beautiful. The open theater came up here. We were nourished by the trees, so to speak, the fields, the mountain. And we improvised a lot here. I wrote plays based on those improvisations. Um, the actors improvised <clears throat> plays for instance, they, they improvised Dar's Day Rock Hudson movies, which were the facade, which was the America that we had been raised in, the pretty facade of the 50s. And I wrote, I wrote a play called I'm Really Here, which starred Joyce Aaron, about Dar's Day and her dis-ease at actually being here and almost like being, it felt almost like being, but it wasn't quite. Something was definitely out of sync. In the 60s, we wanted to get that across. It didn't get any better after the 60s. I think that what's happening to us now, this major, major change is karmically driven. We created a culture of or we, we lived in a culture of greed. I think that culture, consumerism, I think our standards have not been truthful or high. In the 70s, my Tibetan Buddhist teacher came up here, Chagyam Trungpa Rinpoche, 
he too was an immigrant. He was an immigrant from Tibet. We had a light from Tibet, which we could see with, but in somehow we didn't, we didn't make it. We didn't see enough. And that's led us to where we are now, which we now have to deal with. And yes, I think the big, big question that's been interesting me is what do we do to maintain that which is the most precious in the theater, human contact? What do we do to maintain the vitality of audience being in the same place, in the same space, in the same presence as the acting on the stage? So we're wrestling with that. I don't think we should easily accept Zoom, for instance, without noticing it's important what the background is. There's a certain intimacy with Zoom because you see people in their homes. So we're trying to figure out how we can bring people to the natural place, which is like, which is Shantigarh. It's traditional that the four, the five elements, earth, air, fire, water, space, that those should be our teachers because we're made up of those. When you come to the country, when you engage with nature, as we discovered with the open theater, and as young urban people that have been coming up here more recently have discovered, you're nourished. It's a way of coming home. Shantigar means peaceful home. But what do you do when you can't come up here? When there's all this fear, completely justified fear, we can't, we can't do it. We have to do it some other way. We've fallen back a step in the Kali Yuga, the, 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 the fallen age, if you like. Um, but there are ways, I think, that theater and especially acting can evolve. I spent, there were like two stream, like there were two streams in my life, the theater stream and the meditation stream. And they're united a bit by nature. So at this point, I think theater and acting in particular belongs to everyone, not just to professional actors. That division between there's the audience, passive, paying, and there's the acting, paid, professionals. I think we, we can go back now to a more, a circle, the way it was at least figuratively in ancient Greece. The entire community sitting in a circle and Anyone can step out into the middle space, using a metaphor of Peter Brooks, anyone can step into the middle space and embody a question. I think now, when we have to demonstrate from our homes who we are, when intimacy is not come cheaply, intimacy is I'm here in my home, I can show you meditatively, slowly, how I brew a cup of tea, how I think about my ancestors and have pictures of them on the wall. The smallest things, the activities at home can now be communicated in a kind of ceremony. Um, I don't, I, I, does that make any sense, Frank? I'm not sure. Absolutely. It is very, very important. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I'm showing you in the sense that theater shows, I'm showing you my most slow, focused self, 
reaching for a glass. I remember when Trungpa Rinpoche used to give lectures in Boulder, Colorado, the most striking, well, there were a couple of very striking things aside from the things that he said, but one was that he would always keep people waiting for a very long time. That was very striking. This was a Tibetan Lama who had come from Tibet, but it, usually in the middle of it, he would reach for a glass of water or whatever he had there to refresh himself. He would reach for it very, 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 very slowly as slowly as he possibly could. We just watched. I'm not going to do the whole thing, but it was extraordinary to watch a balanced person, which he was as balanced as could be, but he also was in balance, do that action mindfully. That too is theater. I went to see many years, in 1971, I was in India. The mother who was a, uh, she was the consort of Sri Aurobindo, a Jewish lady born in France. She was at that time in her nineties. She was making a public appearance on a balcony. People gathered for the whole day, this was in Pondicherry in India, small town. Eventually, this extremely old lady, extremely old lady in a shimmering green sari came very, very, very slowly out to the balcony. She hooked what, 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 what might look like claws, she hooked her claws over the balcony railing. She looked very, 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 very slowly to one side. And then very, 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 very slowly to the other. Then she looked at us. She unhooked her hands. She walked slowly away. Everyone was completely mesmerized. She made this kind of public appearance three or four times a year. But what was so wonderful about it? She was present. She was here. And when we're present and we're here, that's it. <laughs> There's not much else. You know? So that's theater as well. Was she an actress? Was she a paid professional actress? No. But none of us are. It kind of requires us to go really, really, really deeply into the belly. Being centered there, we move. I had a wonderful friend, Emily Conrad, who founded a way of moving called continual moving, continual movement, where you activate the body through, the, through breathing. And eventually, with your eyes closed, you simply let the body spontaneously do what it needs to do, express what it needs to express. If some of us begin to do that from our homes in, a, in, in, in programs and so forth, we will know each other intimately. We will know each other in ways that we don't know each other now, in ways which are simply facades now. And we'll live in, a, we'll live in more truth. Um, these are things that preoccupy me. Mm -hmm. Have I gone too far afield, Frank? No, Tell no. me. That is, that is uh, you know, you, you have a, a life in theater, a long yeah. career, lots of experience. And you found uh, answers or solutions, or you? No, I have not found any answers or solutions at all. But I. No, not an but, answer. But, but one can make the questions more profound, and one can express the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, what is the idea to say you were successful? You worked in New York. You did this uh, anti-Vietnam play, which defined also its time. But you said, "I'm not going to stay in the city. I go outside." Well. 
to begin with that that play, which was three short plays. The first one, America Hurrah, was actually three short plays. The first one was called Interview, which was based on an exercise I'd seen them do in the open theater. That one talked, spoke of the emptiness, the impersonality of riding the subway, of applying for a job in New York. It was hollow, it was lonely, it was automated. The next one talked about television and how we exchanged our personal identities with what was on the screen and, and were eventually invaded by the screen image, which is interesting in terms of today and the computer. Mm -hmm. we, the computer is now dangerously to be confused with the self. And, and it's dangerous to confuse the computer with the self. And yet it's our way of communicating. So, and then the third one was called Motel. It was for three dolls. That's the one Bob Wilson made the uh, big dolls for. There, were, mm -hmm. there was a motel keeper doll. She was all gray, life size. And there was two, a man and a woman doll who came in and rented the motel room. And eventually the man and the woman doll were not from being rather conventional, began writing graffiti on the walls, began destroying the motel and eventually destroyed the motel keeper. Uh, Carrie destroyed the, the doll that was the motel keeper. It was shocking. It was, it was something, I don't know where I got that but I didn't decide to write that. It didn't come from my head. It came from a need to express anger, I think, and from having read Gordon Craig and Akhtu and all of that. It, 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 was, it, was, it was a scream of rage, really, that needed to get out of me. Um, and it was also, in a way, about the Vietnam War, again, about facade versus truth. In America, everything was apple pie beautiful. Doris Day was happy. Rock Hudson pretended to be heterosexual. Everything was cool in a Doris Day, Rock Hudson world. But behind that, we were throwing bombs. We were, and we were, we were, we were fighting for what in Vietnam? We were, we were, we were, and so we were aggressive. And so of course, those of us who were feeling that demonstrated against it. I've forgotten your question. What was it, Frank? What no, was no, no. Uh, um, um, the idea what what was to what to do, you know, and um, and um, and that um, which I think lots of artists also now are thinking. What do I do at my home, and yes. also where do I go from here? And well, you, my, my if if I may say, in a sense, my home is my theater, as myself is my theater. I think that we all, in some way. Those of us that are artists have to think that. I think if we're creating something, it has to be created from our own depths. If we're performing something, we're performing it with the truth of, of being at home, of being who we are, the age we are. I'm monstrously old at this point, uh, which is astonishing to me. But we, we face these things. We work with what we have. Um, we work from our homes, from ourselves, from our bellies, from a more and more truthful place. That engenders performances which may be very simple, like performing a tea ceremony, but which communicate because they connect from a deep place in you to a deep place in somebody else. And what a luxury to be able to do it from home. I mean, in a sense, that's really... I'm being flipped, but it is luxurious. Mm -hmm. I, in terms of <clears throat> content, I think we have to, I mean, we, we can't go through the hour without saying Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Uh, I think we understand now, I understand now that I didn't know what was happening. I didn't, I, 
there is a realm of, of knowledge and wisdom and compassion which is available to us now through all of this terrible suffering. And we all share it. So we can't pretend it didn't happen. I don't think that we preach in our work. I don't think that helps anything to preach. But to say, I am vulnerable in this way. I vibrate to the harm that I see being done to another human being. I mean, I, if somebody's knee is on somebody's neck and the person says, I can't breathe, how can we live in a place like that? How can we live, how can we live in a world where we don't acknowledge that that has to do with our hearts? So, um, were, you, were, were you asking about content, Frank? I, what, what, uh, what, uh, what shall we do? But maybe also to ask, how do you experience this time? Is this time of Corona any different for you in Shantigar than your- Totally different. Tell us totally it. different. Um, I, I was, well, personally, I was fine until I was 82, which was two years ago. And then I had heart surgery and I went through a whole lot of allopathic drugs, which I had refused before. And so I'm kind of in a weakened state. Um, very odd for me. I'm used to being Superman wandering around my hills here dragging branches from my, and I'd still do that, but, but it's quite different. At the same time, you leave the house, you go into town, small villages, New England, they're empty. It, it feels like the time of my old age and the time when I am thinking about dying and what, how, how I can possibly do it without being in a state of terror, which I flirt with. At the same time, it seems like the world has changed. It's, it's as if we were in a, in a place that one could never have imagined before. We believe that we certainly privileged people, people who had, uh, were artists, people who could at least practice that art, that, or, and maybe everybody, that the world would continue as it was. It, it couldn't. When I was born, there were two and a half billion people on the planet. And now I think there's seven and a half billion people, if not more. So there are people who are exploiting that. And it's not fair, it's not right. We can't live that way. We can't live that way in our small gestures. We can't live that way in our art. We have to come from that awkward central place in the belly and let come out what comes out. Um, yeah. Mm. So is, is Shantigar then closing its gate at the moment? Oh, absolutely not. Shantigar, peaceful oh. home. Thank you for asking. Shantigar, peaceful home. It, it's so beautiful here. It's so incredibly beautiful. It's the height of summer. The peonies are just past. The roses are just past. Um, the daylilies are out. The sun is so warm. It's like Bali-like. We, we, the two or three people who are living here, can step outside and be in a visual paradise. That is what we were offering urban young artists, among others. They could come up here. They did come up here last year, for instance, and they, they, would, they would drink as if from a well. They, they, it's as if I was amazing to watch. People would come up here to take workshops. We gave a lot of workshops in, 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 uh, in theater and in theater and healing and combining different disciplines and meditation and theater and so forth. But people would come up here just to retreat. Young theater people would come up here and they would drink it up. Michael Schreiber, who you met before, has been bringing these people up here. Many students from LaGuardia came up. They came here the world kind of fell, in, fell into place. Well, what, what can you do now that you can't invite 
easily, workshops or young people to do retreats or anyone to do retreats. It's one thing, you, of course you can film stuff and you can make videos, you can make podcasts, it's extremely important. But the big question is always, how do you maintain that contact, the contact with nature? And it's a traditional question. In, 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 in Buddhism, certainly in shamanistic Buddhism, the, as I touched on at the beginning, the elements, earth, air, fire, space, water, are personified also that we're made of them. So it's not only that they're outside. So when you come to the country, you recognize a vibration in yourself that was that's in the trees around you, in the fields around you, in the grass around you, in the flowers around you. It's also, it's, 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 you, you feel that. Well, there are other ways of making contact with that. There are meditative ways of making contact with that. And that connects to what I was saying before about moving, for instance, in continual movement, about making, showing some action, some action of a remembered place, an action of making tea, that showing that, how you can do it mindfully from your center is also a performance by cultivating it, in a sense, in a vertical direction. You, you, you go inside to find these basic elements that we're all made of, and you demonstrate to the world how it is. You have to do that. Otherwise, otherwise we'll just be screens. Genet wrote a play called Screens. The screens. We don't want to just be screens. No. Want to, want to be in nature. Our nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in a way, you occupy these two two fields. One of that's you know that as you said that kind of angry play that dealt uh, with in some way with Vietnam with the facade with um, the, the lies and not the truth. On the other hand, you're close to the idea of the, of the nature of Tibet or Bali, as you mentioned, of meditation. Um, well, I'm how, thank you for putting it that way. That it, it was a journey. Well, they tell us in Buddhism, and I completely believe it. They were already Buddhas. We don't have to strive at it. We're all we're already vibration. We are made of vibrations of of the universe, right? We, I mean, it, it sounds cuckoo to say it that way, but we are. And so, we are already perfect. We're we've got all these blocks. We've got we we have. I think that the leadership that we have is a manifestation of some inner psychological need, which has to be acknowledged in order to let it go. It's, what's astonishing to me is that we could possibly have manifested the leader that we have or the, the leaders or the, how is that even possible except that we needed someone or we need, we, when I say we, I mean the people, the electorate and someone collectively, we need to be abused, for instance, or we need, so let's get rid of that need. Let's be ourselves. And that includes pleasure. We have a right to enjoy our lives on this earth, to enjoy the trees, we have a right to that. Everybody has a right to that. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, so it's, it's, it's not one or the other. There's the beauty of nature and the truth and all of that. And then there's the horrors of, 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 of war and of tyranny and all of that. It's that one screens the other. I believe basically we all want to be free and have joy in each other on this earth. I really do. And so let's tear down what barriers there are to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so do you watch contemporary theater? What's being shown in New York or downtown? Do you go and watch? Well, I, I had a play on last, uh, last spring. Last spring yeah. yeah, called The Fat Lady Sings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I really liked it. Uh, 
it it, uh, it it starred Lauren Flanagan, who's an opera singer. It uh, it was very much about these themes. It was about a family that was very uh, like, and certainly in its archetypal ways, the family that's occupying the White House, or maybe more like a family that would have elected them, and the pain that they were going through, and how they were imposed upon. And the title comes from the mother who doesn't say much. She, she's really very much put upon during the entirety of the play as her children are raped by their father. And I mean, just, it's just horrible. And at the end, she sings, the fat lady sings. It, you know the expression, it isn't over until the fat lady sings. Yeah. Well, it isn't over until the fat lady sings. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so yeah so so I, yes i do so that's of course i went to see my own play um i had to i i had just gotten out of cardiac surgery but i went down to see it mm -hmm. uh, really well done the actor I, I liked it a lot um yes occasionally i've been down but now now it's all what are we going to do now it seems to me is the is the big question um, and what are young people going to do now? As I say, I think it's going to take a completely different form. Um, you, feel, Looking you feel differently back, about that, Frank? You think the theater is going to stay as it is? I am. That would be my question to you. It. I don't think it will be the same. At uh, from from especially, I think the highly commercial landscape uh, in New York at the moment, everything is closed. Uh, that's what's normally people perceive of theater, which is all about money and uh, Broadway and uh, others. And, uh, but uh, um, from your experience, from your work, what you have seen, wh what are forms you think could work? What, what do you see well, we need now from your, what, what would you would like to see? What is it? Well, I, I think I, that's what I've been trying to say. It's not that one, it's not that a playwright would intellectually decide I'm going to write a play about such and such, but rather that that playwright works on herself or himself and allows a dream to emanate, not, not a dream in the sense of I want something, but uh, allows something which is vibrant and personal to come out, to write it down or to speak it or to perform it with all the passion in the world. Whether you're a professional writer or actor or whether you're someone who wants to do that, we have to redefine what it is to be alive. What, and, and part of being alive is being creative. Part of being creative is to be disciplined. So this creative discipline of theater, of sculpture, of art making in every way is absolutely essential. We have to acknowledge the mystery. We don't know, we know nothing. I, I, uh, we, but we keep trying, we keep allowing ourselves to be, to be the vessels to be the communicators of what we feel. So there's been a great deal. I, I talked about the Holocaust at the beginning and, the, and mm -hmm. those of us who were fortunate enough to escape. There's been a lot about that recently. I don't think there's been any event since the Holocaust that's been as major as the COVID crisis. All of mm -hmm. our lives are in the balance. As you mentioned at the beginning, the disadvantaged, the poor, the black, the Native Americans are far more at risk than the others. It's, it's, it's as if we were taking an X-ray of the society and COVID was some kind of skeletal horror revelation. But it's, it's if, so you say, okay, we don't want that. What do we want? We want the, we want the trees that are growing from the belly, so to speak. We want the trees that are beautiful. We want, to, we want to express what is simple 
and good, or we can express what's horrible. It's, it's letting the dream come up, finding a disciplined way of performing and performing it or writing it, whatever your form of art is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, it's, I've always thought that it would be more, it's more interesting to speak from the point of view of a creator than a critic. Uh, people would often ask me, what do you think this and that and the other? I have opinions like everybody else has opinions. But the real question is, how do you actually, how do you actually inhabit that? What is your route to your very center? And then how do you let it out? We're so embarrassed a lot of the time. We're so, or we're proud, or we feel that we can't do something because we were told as young people that we couldn't, or that we're handicapped one way or another. To go deeply in, to leave space, to allow what is down there to emerge is the creative process. It's also the, the route of the breath. So there are, there are practices now um, of all kinds, meditative and theater, which are available to everybody and hopefully will be used. Tell us a bit about these practices which you found, or you would say, this I think you should, as a young artist or artist, you know, this is what you should do to connect uh, to that. Well, I, I, I wouldn't, yeah, you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anybody that this is what you should what do. What do you think? Yeah. But I, I, I collected a number of meditative theater, theatrical exercises in a book called Tea with Demons, Games of Transformation. They're basically games. Meditation, if you like, is a game. Uh, tell us, tell us about it. Well, I have one which is called which is called the vertical gesture. It's it's on YouTube, I think, but it's it should be done standing up. And I don't want to mess up the microphone, but mm -hmm. you you very very slowly, eyes closed, lower your hand, pushing the energy down into the belly, allowing it to be in the belly, past the heart, throat, until you center yourself in your belly. If it doesn't work, do it again. But that's a very powerful tool. Is that a theatrical tool because it's a person standing up normally and doing it? Is it a meditative tool? Who cares what the label is? But I think it's both theatrical and, 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 and meditative. So that's one thing. When you stand up then to perform, to give of yourself, you would do that gesture first. When you feel centered in your belly, then you look at everybody. In this case, you can't see anybody because we're all on screens. I can see you, Frank, I can see the screen. But I look at my environment. I simply look. That allows me to speak for and to everyone. It's a little like that Leonardo, um, famous Leonardo drawing of the, of, of the man with his hands out. And so you have the vertical gesture, then you have the horizontal gesture. <clears throat> then in, in a workshop that I might give, you go into movement with your eyes closed, but it's related to the continual movement that I was talking before about before you begin to move just not in a deliberate, no planned way, no choreographed way, but you allow your body to be the author of these movements. You do what movements are necessary. You eventually allow your body to initiate what you're going to talk, talk about, perform, and usually, I ask people to allow an incident to arise spontaneously, something from childhood, a moment, and then to speak for their senses. I see this, I'm there, it's simple. So you become a vehicle rather than a controlling 
uh, intellect who's imposing something on material. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you a very rushed idea of what well, of the work that we might do in the workshop. It's important to say these are things we also can do now on the in, in Yes, it's okay. now possible for people to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. We've given we gave a workshop here uh, the other day on on, on the moving body, in mm -hmm. which uh, two very skilled teachers uh, demonstrated. Then you can go to people's home. People can try it. Can do it. I think we have to get very creative with Zoom or whatever the media are so that not only do we, that we don't keep it two dimensional. So mm -hmm. that there's ways that we enter into people's homes and into people's hearts. Uh, I, I saw a uh, performance of a concert performance in which individual artists would perform from their homes. It was very, very moving. Someone in a sense playing her piano from her home. You feel transported in a way that is not quite the same as if they're doing it in a concert hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think uh, this is, it is as significant, you know, to be a reminder that uh, in a way, as you say, theater starts in that way, or whether it's theater or meditation. And that is something we, are as our generations, minds and the younger ones are more and more understanding that there is a very deep and significant connection which you saw early on and you also practice. So how does your day look like? Do you uh, write? Do you do meditation? How is it structured? What, how, do, how is the day for you in Shanti? For me? COVID time. Personally. Well, it's very different now that I'm dealing with, with, with illness and so forth, which I never intended to deal mm -hmm. with before. <clears throat> so... Ideally, I go out in the woods. That for me is the most important thing. When I go up into the woods and I drag branches around, I put them into great big piles. I've been doing that in my woods for about 25 years. I can get all my frustrations out. I can just keep dragging branches and obsessing about this and obsessing about that and obsessing about that. In the meanwhile, there are these beautiful, beautiful woods. And I'm, what am I creating? I'm creating space. There's less distance between this spot and that spot. I'm not, there's no purpose to it except to make space. I uh, sometimes, I challenge myself not to pick up anything, just to walk the path. Sometimes I lead people on a meditation walk down the path very, 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 very slowly, uh, paying attention to how your foot falls, heel, toe, heel, toe, which is at the same time you're paying attention to your breathing without breathing in any special way. Your eyes are half open, half closed, so that you're not grabbing with the eyes, but you're allowing the flow to come between you and the world that you see. We, we were doing that once. I was at the head of the line. There was a fox that came around the corner. He or she actually rounded the path and facing us, saw us and went away. It's amazing to have this contact with the wildlife. This morning, there was a large rabbit by the front porch. What a privilege, what an incredible privilege. So my day is like that. <clears throat> I'm sure everybody's day is different. Um, but you find your disciplines, you find your meditation. You do, uh, I have friends, we have a meditation room here. I have a friend who's very, here who's very, very disciplined, goes to have meditate at a particular hour every day, meditates for a while, goes upstairs, does exercises. I do that sometimes. And sometimes I'm not good enough. I mean, I'm not... Uh, disciplined enough to do it recently. But I've been very disciplined in my life and also very disciplined in terms of what I've eaten. I've been on weird diets. I've, had, I've been in a privileged enough position to be able to do that and mm. kept me radiantly healthy. Um, yeah, like that. Right, do you find time to write in this time of Corona? Is that possible? Yes, it is possible. I do write. 
I would like to be writing more. I want to be writing about my family and the Exodus, which I touched on before. Mm -hmm. I, I, I now begin to understand how to order my memoirs, if you like. There's, um, we were crossing the ocean. I was four years old. We had escaped barely the onslaughts of Hitler. I had acted up rather the way a child might. Nobody could tell me, oh, we're fleeing, we're fleeing for our lives. We, people want to kill us. My mother came to say goodnight to me when we were on the boat. She said, mommy loves you very much, but if you're not a good boy, mommy will have to love you less. That to me encapsulates something which is, I've had to fight for the rest of my life. What did she mean? to be a good boy. What did that mean? I don't know that she knew what it meant. She had managed to get me out of there. My father had managed to get us out of Europe. My grandparents, I mean, it, it was an incredible thing that they did, but it left, it left a gap in knowing how to, how to be and how to behave. I think I'm not the only one. I know I'm not. So I'm wanting to explore that. That's very interesting to me. At this point, there are many, many letters from my family. Some of some of written by people who survived, some written by people who did not survive. I think the time of COVID's is like that in a way. Uh, the when, when you listed how many people had it, you said sixty-eight percent in Corona Queens or something like that. It's I mean, imagine talking about that in in the world we lived in even only six months ago. We're, we're now living the consequence of, of how we've thought, of the patterns of our thinking and the patterns of our feeling. So what we have to do, I think, is go deeper and come up with material which is more deep than the usual patterns, yeah? yeah. Um, and, we have to, and we have to change things. I have a friend who is here at Shantigar, Rand Engel, who is researching ways in which the police might be defunded. It ways in which it would not, ways in which it might actually happen. Some of us go out and protest. Some of us try to make it happen. We each have our skills, but we have to work together to have it happen with discipline. And they, these are meditative tasks. They are not different from meditation. They're not different from theater in a certain sense. Mm. I talk a lot. <laughs> this is, uh, this is, uh, it, it's truly, uh, it's truly, uh, significance what you say about I know that I think Cantor once said that when he did his early work you know it's like you say you have a, a corpse a dead person in the room and you have to have the same level of awareness yes work so yes there's around us um, you mentioned it you know so you said I'm afraid of of course you know how do I deal with that and uh, we all are and getting getting older and and you did also that play the Tibetan book of the death. What is your, what is your take? What's your take on that? What is your take on being so close? Um, that shake can kill us. I mean, we had Taylor Mack here on the, the great artist who said, now I have friends who survived AIDS, but a handshake, the wrong one, can kill them. And they did. He said, I have friends that didn't survive it. Right. Well, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to attach to what you, I'm going to comment on what you said to begin with. <laughs> we need to go deeper in ourselves, reintegrate from a deeper place and express from a different place. It's not like we are our old selves and simply repattern what 
that's important too, but what we, what the, the way we see the world, but we go to a deeper, I mean, I think of it always in vertical and horizontal terms. We go to a deeper place vertically. We are, we, 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 we see the cruelty of the world more. We are angered at it more. We, 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 know, we don't yet have the name for how we're going to be. We're going to change, we're changing. And then from that change place, presumably from a deeper place, we discover how to, how to be art in the world, how to be artists in the world, how to be protesters in the world. All of that is integrated. And I don't think it's terribly different. I mean, one thing from another. Mm. Hello? Tell us about that, the play, the Tibetan book of that. Why did you do that? And what did you find when you did it? Well, I did, I wrote the Tibetan book of the, of the dead. <laughs> I didn't write the Tibetan book of the dead. I made a play of the Tibetan yeah, book of the dead, which I, which I, and the subtitle was, or how not to do it again. The idea is that we're, as I said before, we're all enlightened beings. We, the idea of the Tibetan book of the dead is don't make the same mistakes you've made before or you'll be reborn into a life quite similar or even worse than the one you've got now. Um, I wanted to create something that could be read aloud to the dying or to oneself if somebody you knew was dying. The, the profound and deep works that have been written about the Tibetan book of the dead are usually commentary. My teacher, Chögyam Trungpa, wrote a book on, uh, of it, uh, a commentary, along with Francesca Fremantle. Sogyal Rinpoche wrote another book, but it's commentary. It's a big text, as if it were some academic exploration ground. But I wanted something that was more like poetry. We, I, I, so I also wanted to, to demonstrate that it was for real people. Um, I'm struggling with that now. What I thought maybe I would dodge the bullet, bullet. Maybe I was immortal. Maybe I was so healthy, I'd get away with it all. So clearly I'm not, nor is anyone. Um, so I wanted to explore that transition, the possibility of a transition, what it was like. It's also the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It's, it's, it's a book for the living and the dying. Because as I spoke about before, we are made of the very elements that surround us. We are earth, air, fire, water, so forth. So how do we get through this? I'm glad you asked me because I, I think I have been shying away from seeing that in terms of my current situation. What will it be like? Um, it will be what it will be, but I have to keep my equanimity just as I have to in life. I haven't been very good at that recently, but I have to keep my equanimity, see what happens. And the, the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is usually traditionally read aloud in Tibet. It was read aloud by what's called a spiritual friend, but basically it's the word friend which matters. Somebody keeps saying to you, it's okay, it's okay. Just breathe, just go through it. If you see something terrible, it's because you're projecting something terrible on it. It's okay, just keep going. So it says that, but in a very, very profound way. So I worked on it with um, my friend, Didi Goldenhar, who was helping me. We refined it, it was like, taking those thick texts and getting down to the essence of it, like currying a horse, if you will. That's what my hands are doing, they're currying a horse. And then we got it down to some, I got it down to some poetry, if you like. And then I translated it into French and then back from French into English to get rid of all the extraneous stuff, to be, have it be really simple and profound. So. That's that, and, and so it was a play first. It was done at La Mama. I always think that Ellen Stewart at La Mama and Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche 
were, were my ment more than my mentors. They're both my teachers, the meditation teacher and the wonderful theatrical friend that Ellen was. So I dedicated it to the two of them. Um, and so we did it as a play. It seemed, to, it seemed to move people in a way that had nothing to do with me, nothing to do with intellectual intention. It seemed to reverberate the way a bell reverberates. It just reverberated in space. Um, and people felt healed by it. I, have, I think it had to do with the intention of everybody working on it. It was directed by Asur Banipal Babila, a Persian man, Iranian. Um, and then I, after it was a play, I wanted it to be a book. So it became a book, uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead for reading aloud or how, for reading aloud. And it, it's available now. And I'm really pleased that having been the channel for that. I don't think, I don't, I, 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 would, I would never have thought in this lifetime that I would have done a thing like that, but you just channel these things. You make yourself as clear a vessel as possible and it comes out. No, it's an amazing, uh, amazing piece you created, amazing work, amazing uh, piece of poetry, writing, and also connecting, you know, through, through those words, to, to, to layers and times and wisdom and, uh, and experiences, you know, that were well, for us I, and will be after us. You know. I think, I think that I didn't create anything. I just got out of the way, so to speak. I, I, let, it, I, I let it sort of bubble around in me. I, I also do these calligraphies, these uh, brushworks. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I, my teacher Trungpa Rinpoche did, did brushworks, not quite the same way, but I watched him do it on my kitchen table when he was here doing a year's retreat at Chantigar. And later I found myself doing these brushworks too. I move for maybe 45 minutes, make sounds, and clear myself. Then when I really clear, I do that kind of vertical gesture that I showed before. And then I take the brush, I allow the energy or the image and the energy to come up through me and come out through the brush. I look at it, 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 it either has, it either is the movement or it's not. If it's not, I tear it up. And if it is, it is. So that's a very interesting way to work too, as a as a, as, a, as an artist, as a painter, mm -hmm. uh, to to catch. That well, movement. to be spontaneous, to yeah, to just be in a way to be a wind tunnel, and the wind whooshes through you. You don't impede it. You the wind is your emotions. You let it come out in the brush, and there it is, or there it's not. <laughs> so I use some of those as illustrations in the Tibetan Book of the Dead for reading aloud. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a significant practice. I think Roland Barthes, the great French critic, he went to Tokyo and Japan, got fascinated, and he then would have his little table next to him, next to his writing. He did that, and to really, I didn't know that. It changed his work. He said it changed his writing to 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 do that. Yeah. Did he say how it changed his writing? I, to me, it's just all one thing. But I'm very interested. Well, how did he say it changed his writing? Well, I have to, uh, to go back. I just went his yeah. Writing. Well, it's interesting. I think that everything feeds everything. If you get, to, if you if you can do something with greater spontaneity, you can do everything with, or many things with greater spontaneity. I I found that that I became freer of what Tibetan Buddhists call ego. Became freer of the watcher. Became freer of self consciousness in my teaching first, mm -hmm. way before my writing. But one thing leads to another. You find, how it, you find how it works in one way, it leads to how it works in another. Yeah. yeah. I think he, what he liked about it, if I recall it now right, he was accused of reversing his arguments and his ideas. He would say, it's the death of the author. The author doesn't exist. It just goes through him. It's nothing to do with him. There's no authorship. Yeah. Um, in itself and then he would go back no it has everything to do how we grew up and people say how can you say that and he said well that's what i think now and i think his idea of the moment of the painting of the brush and its beauty and also in its failing that was missing um it's an acknowledgement but i think mostly yeah also the contrasts uh, you know, the black and yeah. white something he says a philosopher will try everything to keep things open to not define to not make clear an artist a sculpture you make a sculpture it's the most defined what you can do. 
like uh, Fernando Pessoa, who's at the sculpture of the gods, ultimately they're just sculptures, you know, so yeah. Yeah. they are a definite form and then they are the indefinite of the thinking. And we all know from philosophy, there's nothing that really works. They are all constructions, they are dreams and they are uh, models of, of, for the world and some work better on them, some not. You sound, you sound, you sound very much like a, like a Buddhist, uh, uh, it's have, not this. It's not this, it's not not this, it's not this, it's not that. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, I should find out. What did you see in theater? I would be interested. What did you see, they say, this was great theater, that was great performance? In my whole life? In the whole decade. The first, the first thing that I, one of the very first things that I ever saw was Gertrude Lawrence in um, um, Anna and the King of Siam, in, in The King and I. She, she was so bubbly. She was wonderful. Um, oddly enough, one of my great, maybe not oddly, but one of my great heroes is Noel Coward uh, and comes from that world, not because of the content of what he did, but because of his honesty. He was a gay man like I am, but he, there was something so elegant and beautiful about his, I love, I love Noel Coward. I have a picture of him on my piano, a, a sort of autographed picture of him. So uh, The King and I was one thing, Ethel Merman. I, I love musicals in, in Annie Get Your Gun. And uh, she, those things, I think uh, I'm, I can hear you saying, my gosh, he just, no. <laughs> he fell for it all hook, line and sinker. I did, um, I guess, very importantly was uh, Marat Saad. Um, it was very major for me. I remember yeah. Joe Chaikin, who was my, as close to my partner in this lifetime as I've had. Joe took me to see it because he'd worked with Peter Brook in London. I went to see it on Broadway. I was, I was just completely bowled over. The idea that a play could work on many different levels and you could see it working on many different levels at the same time. You know, they were they were they were inmates in Charenton. They were they were at, in the in the French Revolution or in the French Terror. Who was the audience? What it was it was the idea that something could be so magnificently multifaceted was mind blowing to me. It was great. Um, what else has moved? I don't. I think that may have been that may have been one of the things that moved me the most. Um, there, there, I'm, I, I guess I've never made a list of that, but that there, the, the, I, I'll, I'll keep thinking about that, but I, that's what I can think of for the moment. What was that exercise George Reichen did or the open theory is that this was the first scene of your first act of America Hurrah, but you came out, you said it came out of an exercise. What was that? Yeah, well, the exercise was that the actors, um, there were about seven or eight actors in the open theater who were finding out how many people could talk at once when you could still recognize what was being said. So there was a line of actors on a stage. They would talk one, then another, then two or three would talk at the same time. They were supposed to sense when to talk and so forth. So that was the exercise. To me, and then I, 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 I came up here to Shantigar, having heard that exercise on stage on a Friday, I wrote the play, which was originally called Pavan, up here on that weekend. I, I, I was playing, I don't know how I came up with it, but I thought, well, that would be interesting, do an employment agency, because there are applicants and there, there are uh, people interviewing them, so just do it that way. I don't know why I picked on that particular thing, so there was the give and take of the people in the agency when one person would speak, several people would respond and so forth and so forth. Then there was a space for monologues. Um, each of the characters had their own monologue. The woman on the subway, the man who looked up from his TV to see the real world, all of those things. And a lot of it took place on 14th Street, which at that time was a much more popular place. Um, and, and that, so I developed it, that's, that's how I developed it. It was called Pavan. I thought of it very much in terms of rhythm. 
When we did America Hurrah Off-Broadway, which was not the first production of it, Joe directed it. And at that time, I renamed it Interview because he played around with it and changed it a lot as he was wont to do, not the words, but the staging. Uh, so that, that was Interview. Yeah, and if I remember right, also in Italy, it got interrupted and... Uh... In Italy? Well, we, we opened it, ultimately, we opened it at Teatro degli Arte uh, in Rome. Um, at the, we got there, we, we, we got to Rome with the, with the open theater. We suddenly, re I think we had left New York because I'd had a big success with America Hurrah. We were not at all sure about these three, about, about doing, um, well, we were doing The Serpent, actually. We were not, um, this is really about the serpent. We were not sure that the serpent would be seen as the experimental work it was. We went to Italy and uh, we were all frightened. We had, we, we, it, we had about a hundred paparazzi coming and um, eventually uh, it worked out. Uh, but you're th you're saying that people interrupted it in Italy. I don't remember that. I don't remember that story. You wrote in the reading is somewhere about maybe that's that's what it, no it, no. It could have been it could have been an interview. It was certainly done there, but I don't remember that. And I and I just jumped to the story about the serpent. I don't know why, but yeah, that's, which uh, was a collaborative piece. The yeah. serpent was entirely collaborative. It started with, you and it was an important thing to know that a group of people could make a play. Yeah, that is so we all think of it now, it's, uh, it's normal, you know, we have to really also reflect on how that we had Eugenio Barbara here on the program who said, you know, when we did workshops, also to make some money for our company, there were no workshops, you had to be at an academy, but you were rejected or not, and that we were all rejected in Norway, but we made our own company, we, and what you say, you know, that it, people would come together and write a play collaboratively, how radical that was. Or you say there was an exercise with actors and based out of that, I created a play, you know, so forms you, you found so early on that uh, um, were pioneering of what we now think is normal, or might even might even, you know, that's old fashioned or whatever, but I think uh, uh, it is still a, a significant wor work. And as you also say, you know, to have that illumination that it is not about the professional artists anymore. It's about everyone, that everyone can yeah. participate, can be on a stage, can, uh, can, can do that. So these are radical, um, radical um, inventions. Um, we are getting a bit closer to this session. I think we could do it so many times and much longer, but the New York City is in a, in a tough place. Uh, over a million jobs are gone. Uh, you go now and you see the shop windows and, uh, you know, advertising are taken down, it's for rent. Some say a fifth of all businesses will not make it. Some say fifths of all nonprofits won't make it. It, was, it will be a tough time. When you did work in New York, also it was not in a great shape. In the 70s, it was close to death. Uh, also, it couldn't pay its bills. What do, what do you say uh, uh, to artists? What do you say to, uh, to theater makers now um, how to experience this about how to prepare for it let's say the what we call the TAC the time after corona if it comes and a hundred vaccinations are being worked on if there's a one percent chance that one work one of them will so it's only a matter of time so uh, but what what do you say to artists what uh, compared to well, what I, I think in a certain sense we're all artists um, I, I think it's a, I, I think it's I think it's not going to be like it ever, like it was ever again. That's simply my feeling. Really, ever again? Well, I think ever again. Yes, I think it may it may get better. I hope it does. I hope we can, but I don't think it will ever be the same world again. I listened to a really um, fascinating epidemiologist on Democracy Now which is a wonderful news show that I listen to frequently. Um, she said, well, she said earlier on that she thought it, it would be 36 months at least. And then now, since the Trump administration so mishandled it and acted so selfishly, she says it's going to be three years at the very minimum, but I don't think it'll ever be the same. I think there's social distancing is going to happen. We live in a completely new era. Um, 
a, an era of great pain, but also great possibility because we can play with different forms, because we can see each other in each other's homes, because we will recognize when we're speaking the truth, because we will find new forms to speak the truth. We'll understand that we're all artists. We can all play our violin from home and we must play our violin from home and have other people hear it. I think, I think there are possibilities, but it's a time of, it's a time of acknowledging that we messed up as a society. We really messed up. This is like an x-ray of the society. And what does that mean we messed up? We came from a, we came from a place that was not a deep place in ourselves. We, 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 we acted selfishly. We wanted for ourselves. We ignored other people, the feelings of others. It won't work, it hasn't worked. And we have to work very hard not only in the outer world, but simultaneously in our own acknowledgement of our bellies. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a significant uh, advice and also a significant evaluation hearing from you that since World War II, you think that, um, this is the same, will have the same effect. I, I feel that, I, I do feel that very strongly. Somehow, Somehow we were lucky. My family was lucky. We got out. My father had some idea of what was coming. My mother was courageous. She drove us through the bombs. Somehow we found what was necessary, but it wounded us. It, it, it wounded my parents. It wounded me. And it killed millions and millions and millions of people. It's too bad that this has to happen. It's too bad that it has to happen. But everything that we can do to our, express our deepest selves and with pleasure at expressing ourselves, but our deepest selves, it's our obligation to do that. Mm. And to be, to be the elements, to be the trees that I can see out the window from here, to be the fields, to be nature, to be those elements within ourselves that combine uniquely in each of us and express it, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's a significant and deep and intense and uh, so we, in a way we have to find our Shantigar, you know, something that you created in whatever way and form it is and to take the change of the outer world as serious as the change of our inner world. Right? Yes. Yes, and that, that the outer world has changed is a signal that we weren't living in it from the deepest possible place. And whoever gives us life, wherever life comes from, it should be expressed from a deep, deep place. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, mm -hmm. And our compassion for other human beings from that deep place as well, sure. But it ain't gonna be the same as before. We, 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 we've, we've, we've taken a step down and the challenge is greater. Mm -hmm. Not but taken a step, we, 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 we've karmically ended up a whole level different. But it's also good to hear from you that you say this deep place uh, can be reached and that forms will come and that there will be forms and ways of expression. Absolutely, absolutely there will be. I can't predict them, but they are to be looked for in intimacy, intimacy with oneself, intimacy with the people one loves, and the intimate connection that one feels when one sees on somebody suffering. Mm. That's what it will come from, not from anything else. Mm. It will come from that and, and saying, I have to express that. There's no other reason to be alive. I have to express that. So, and you don't know you don't know what that expression will be. You touch, you, you, you go to the deep place, you connect with the world, you allow your body to move, you say what needs to be said, that's play, that's a play, that's a performance, that's a life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And art can do a big, play a big role in that to make us aware. And yes, know. that is art, absolutely. 
truthful and uh, and but then it's always transcending. So really, uh, Jean Claude, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for for sharing. Um, well, thank you, Frank. I, I think your questions are really penetrating. They stimulate me. Thank you very much, and thank you for doing this in-depth kind of work. Thank you. Thank you, and 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 I hope you know if. Uh, that time after Corona, if it comes closer than the epidemiologist said, you know, that also your place, you know, will be even more visible that people will come and understand and also learn from, um, from, from what you, what you have done in your life as an artist and human being and spirit. And, uh, and yes, yeah, so I think I will order your book. Uh, I had it, uh, I think when you came and did the reading of it and I just gave it to someone, but I think, uh, to have that with me, to read it, and to be perhaps friends for people who, who are, or someone else will do it for me. We don't know, you know. So uh, it's a time of great uncertainty, and um, it was a great privilege. And thank you for being my, so my privilege. Thank you, Frank. So honest, and uh, and um, and I think that is a, a, a great contribution to the kaleidoscope of voices, and uh, and um, and uh, makes the younger voice look young and sometimes older and older voices look very young and wise. <laughs> something that connects uh, and contributes um, to each other. So, uh, and really respect for all you did in your life. It's a, a fantastic model what a theater artist can do, defining him herself in a larger way and to create a place for a community to create a neighborhood uh, where, where people can be. And we will continue our, our, our journey um, next week again because it's getting so complicated again also in, in New York and in the US we go a little bit back we're going to have Ping Chong uh, come and talk about his, his work and his uh, company someone who also came by the way at the age of four uh, to, uh, to uh, New York. Um, we Very interesting. Significant young artist from uh, Berlin who is a, works at the folks with Susanne Kennedy who is truly mm -hmm. finding a way or as I say, and we say the children of the digital age in the play of what Brecht said, that theater is a, for, the, for the children of the technological age, the analog, but now we have that different one. She's finding ways uh, to connect to that world of screens, of digital experiences, VR, which she represents on stage in a very different way and a very good one. Mabu Mines will be with us, Lee Brewer, and uh, Maud Mitchell will tell about their uh, work and their ongoing uh, and, and engagement um, and Tiago Rodriguez, a significant European director from Portugal and not as much known yet as he should, he will join us on Thursday, if all works out, but I think we, uh, we will. And then Carrie that switch will tell us a bit about her experience. She's a great playwright, but also uh, writes uh, feuilletons and translates beautifully, beautiful work and has observed uh, the Latino, Latinx community for a long time, created also. Um, gathering symposia um, and so and uh, and we will hear um, from her how she experiences this time of corona so thanks to HowlRound again for hosting us another week and it means a lot to us so VJ, Thea, Travis thank you for putting up with us every day of the week uh, and thanks to legal team San Yang and Andy and especially to you viewers uh, we went a little bit over time today but i think this was very very significant very important and there might be something in there that can change your life or my life and is of significance so really let's uh, understand that art is not as we also said of changing just an evening as an experience or as a wallpaper as a karaoke no it's really meant uh, by artists by jean claude to create a change in us and to be present, to understand the world and to see what's real and to be closer to, to the moment we live in. So I think this was a great, great reminder. So Jean-Claude, thank you so much. And so much. Thank you, Frank. I, I really enjoyed this opportunity. Uh, thank you. And thank uh, you. up again, you know, uh, on all around later on. So thank you all and encourage everybody to listen to what Jean-Claude said. I think this was truly of importance as with so many of our